welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on the issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Hello and welcome to New Cyber Frontier. This is Abe Thompson. I'm broadcasting from the Secure, SecureSet campus of Colorado Springs. I'm the campus director here, uh, standing in for our good friend and colleague, Chris Gorog. Uh, my guest today is Joshua Davis, who's the director of strategic partnerships and security evangelist for Circadence. Uh, welcome aboard, Joshua. Thank you, sir. How you doing today, Abe? I'm doing awesome. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, I love uh, love using my gift of gab for something useful. Uh, so, as I understand, Josh, uh, you're fairly new in your role there at Circadence. Can you talk about uh, why you ended up there and uh, what's uh, what's going on? Absolutely. So, my background: I got undergraduate computer science. Uh, I started at Georgia Tech Research Institute almost 20 years ago. Um, I was in research for Department of Defense predominantly during that time. I eventually got my MBA, which was kind of hard to go from computer science to uh, the business side, but it kind of opened my view of the world. Jumped into cyber, say probably, really was doing cyber back in the mid-90s, uh, didn't realize it was called cyber, and then around the time in the uh, mid-2000s, we actually started a, a lab at Georgia Tech uh, getting into cyber, so I started playing around the DEF CON, black hat, you know, being a quote-unquote hacker. I actually had my certified ethical hacker certificate in my CICP for a while until I decided to just let them lapse. And then, um, yeah, Georgia Tech, 20 years doing DOD research, fascinating, amazing, but uh, I felt like I needed to change, and uh, I learned about Circadence. And Circadence, it's a gaming company first that shifted into cyber range development in the 20s, I mean 20s, in the 2000s. And, uh, and now it's got a host of products around training in a gamified environment. So I'm pretty impressed with where it's going and the vision of the CEO is all about data, AI and machine learning, and not just buzzwords. Well, that's very exciting. And, and I uh, have a soft place in my heart for sort of the cyber range concept and training, having, uh, having spent a good portion of my life in the military uh, utilizing such, such things and, and I greatly appreciate um, some of the tools and the methodologies that are out there. And I, I love this move toward uh, finding out where the people are and this gaming environment actually has certainly been quite successful. Um, now, uh, I, I listened to your diverse background there and it's, it is interesting that you've kind of crossed the sort of the MBA divide. I, I too have a, have a master's, mine's in public administration. Um, having delved both into the cyber and then to the business realm and, and lived kind of on both sides of, of that element. Um, highlight a little bit more uh, your desire to, to, to make the change and specifically talk about how you uh, decided to let some of those certs lapse. That's, that's a great question. Um, I would say I thought about this a lot. So uh, at the core of who I want to be is mm -hmm. like I am a software guy love software. I'm amazed with the ability that software brings to humans, and I like to articulate that software to me is one of the first times that humans were actually capable of articulating, documenting, recording, and sharing knowledge. Mm. Granted, it requires a computer to human interface for that knowledge to be, you know, uh, instantiated. Uh, this software is just amazing. So as I studied my MBA, I started realizing that value is not just about optimization and how sexy your code is. It's about actually providing a solution to a problem. So software is obviously a wonderful medium to actually perfect that art. And then as I started getting into cyber, I always felt like in the core of who I wanted to be, software guy coupled with being a, a criminal. Okay, not really a criminal, but the, the concepts around black hat, white hat, gray hat offenses with cyber was always intriguing to me, the kind of cloak and dagger piece. Certainly. It's definitely not as sexy as you think when you learn more about it. It's definitely a lot more complicated than you realize, but software definitely makes it easier. So as I studied, as I met, I started to realize 
especially working with the DOD, because there's standard policies in DOD that mandate certain certs. Just because you have a cert doesn't mean you're a hacker. Uh, and I would say that for me, uh, getting the CEH wasn't that hard. Uh, I knew how to study, I knew how to take a test. But what I realized is folks that really are good at the art form, and that's just about any domain, it's about practice and, and doing. And someone like me, who, uh, just like you, Abe, uh, likes to talk a lot, uh, I like to gab, and I like to learn, I'm not the guy that's gonna be sitting behind the point of the spear, you know, shooting, defending, pen testing, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm gonna be the guy that helps evangelize and help share a perspective and a story. And these concepts around ranges and the, the way the military's been working at the problem, which, I mean, the military's been working on this problem uh, far longer than 90s. I mean, you can get into concepts of electronic warfare and such that really lend it to this sort of technology and the sort of approach that we're using now. So the idea of culture changing around the globe and sort of this problem being put on everyone's doorstep, I, I just jumping in and transitioning into it like almost like an evangelist role uh perfect for me absolutely and this is a great spot for us to stop and uh, listen in on our sponsors we'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors cyber resilience institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. And we're back. I'm talking with Josh Davis, uh, a security evangelist and the director of strategic partnerships for Circadence. Um, we got into a lot of great stuff there. What an interesting um, and very philosophical journey you've been on, actually. You've, you've, you've applied some thought, and, and I love interacting with folks that have actually done some critical thinking as they've made various leaps in their career and in their life. And one of the things you, you hit on um, that was uh, very intriguing to me, especially uh, in, in my industry as a, as a cybersecurity educator, um, I'm not only interested in the education, but sort of the outcome, which is, which is uh, getting folks placed in the industry and, and addressing this problem on a larger scale. Um, you talked about the CEH test as an example. And CEH being a certification, you mentioned that you know how to study and you know how to take a test. And if, if I'm reading between the lines a little bit there, um, you know, you have some concerns about uh, reliance simply on uh, a certification over what you said, which is the ability to practice and do. Uh, can you unpack that a little bit more? Absolutely, and I don't want to be attacking uh, CH here. I would say part of my experience has been that education, training, um, certification, I mean, including academia. I mean, I was in Georgia Tech for, you know, a couple decades. Uh, the belief that when someone goes through and gets a piece of paper saying they accomplished something, I, I would say when it comes to cybersecurity, maybe other art forms, but cybersecurity is sort of this domain it's so much more complicated, it's so much more dynamic, it's so much more evolutionary and kind of how, I would say revolutionary, and how the domain changes. The thought process is that someone probably needs to come out with, they're not gonna get that through a degree or a cert. It's about doing, and it's about practice. So that's sort of where I was going. Um, I mean, obviously certs and degrees have a place. Um, you have to weed out some. Furthermore, certs can be good motivators for getting an education in there, but when you're in a hiring manager, you're leaning upon exclusively whether or not someone has this cert, or you're the DOD, which I don't know how many of your listers, Department of Defense, know there's policies that dictate what certs you have to have yeah. to go function certain roles. Uh, I, I'm concerned that our warfighters are not necessarily the, the best equipped. You know, and, and you, that you your today? Oh, oh, positively, and I wholeheartedly agree that, uh, well, I was an educator myself, taught at the college level as well, so I've been in academia, I've also been in uh, DOD, and now in, in the cybersecurity industry and the private sector. 
And, and I do recognize the value of certs as one variable in a very complex matrix or even better, a, a complex mosaic when you're looking at the value of a person. I, yeah. I, I recognize the, the value of an education. I mean, my good buddy, uh, Chris Gorg, our regular host here, I mean, he's, he's you know, steeped in um, the academic industry and, and environment. Uh, so those all have a, a valuable mosaic, but the reality is in the workforce piece, you must have also that documented, demonstrable ability to do the work. And so, you know, it, as long as those I, things are complementary and, you know, support one another, there, there's great value in that mosaic. So I definitely hear you on that. Well, on that note, let me just add one more thing. It's sort of what I think is happening. And part of this conversation of certs and degrees are is happening after the invention of the Internet yeah. and the way that humans have connected and are communicating. So we cannot anticipate our education philosophies, our training philosophies, to stay the same in the context of how we've evolved as humans to communicate. So I would say we're at this sort of salient point, this change in our culture of what does a degree mean, what does a cert mean in the context of a career for me. Um, some, of my, some of my most favorite uh, cybersecurity experts, uh, one in particular I'm going to call him out, his name is Matt Yonkman, uh, EmergingThreats.net. The sucker has no degree, writes code, and is well known in the industry because he's talented. I mean, and I feel like that's something else about the art form of cyber is talent uh, and, 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 like you said, demonstrable capability far exceeds a certain degree. Well, and, and we are a community, right? As In the cybersecurity industry, we recognize that we're a community, and I think value in a community um, can be ascribed to the diversity we have, like the, the Yonkmans with self-taught um, prowess, right? right. The, the, the juggernauts like, you know, uh, Josh Davis with all his time at, at Georgia Tech, the, the experienced um, guy coming out of the military with, with very tactical and practical cybersecurity experience. We, we are a diverse community and it's recognized. In fact, if you think right. about like uh, CEH or even as you've heard about the hunt, the hunt teams that are now emerging and, and uh, you know, we even do a we even do a component of hunt training here. Uh, that's a diversity in and of itself because we're not just looking at super tech weenies. We're looking at analytical folks. We're looking at uh, mathematicians, folks from the hard scientists. We're looking at political scientists. We're looking at historians. So many of these different people can come into our community. Uh, can you comment on that, that idea of diversity in the cybersecurity so, community? Well, so I want to back up a bit to the, the word community. Yeah, um, great. So let's go to physics. Let's go to math. There are strong communities in academia. Yeah. And the process that you go about building upon these pillars, right? You're like, was it, uh, you're on the shoulders of giants when you publish your, uh, when you actually, you know, accomplish your thesis and, and become a PhD, right? Get your DS, uh, dissertation accepted by your peer. Uh, that's a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing. There's a there's a mentor who's your advisor, who you're hammering and learning about this domain, and you and you publish, and you become known, and you have impact upon that community. The difference here in cyber, it's not about papers being published and produced. It's about software being implemented. It's about understanding, I guess, data and applying it probably with software in ways that's useful. So I don't want to say that academia PhD research is not useful, but it's it's not applied in the same sense as cyber. So cyber, yeah, by definition, it's uh, it's is even though it's abstract, it still has to be touched, it has to be real, it has to be experienced. Yeah, it entirely entirely accurate statement um you brought up another and and we can get back to this uh uh in a little bit but you brought up another sort of hot button item these days you you mentioned ai and you know there are some very strong feelings in the cyber security cyber security community about uh the future of our industry as it relates to ai um give me your sort of uh um you know master's dissertation on uh, where that might be going okay so in short one thing we humans have done now, because of the internet and because of software, um, we are generating entirely too much data and information for humans to manually process. Clearly. <laughs> now, what's cool is, uh, what I love, and, and I'm scared, I don't know how much of you listeners are uh, Ray Kurzweilian, 
and the singularity. I don't agree with Ray Kurzweil's theory that AI is going to become uh, self-aware in like 2035. But what I do believe is there's going to be so much data and information that the only way for us humans to make it useful is going to be leveraging tools such as uh, AI and machine learning. Because um, there's just not enough of us, and there's not enough time. And I don't know how many folks have an Alexa, but I got one sitting in front of me. Um, and, and my belief is we're going to keep seeing more and more assistance holding our hands through this experience as humans. Well, that's so that's a, are going to be driven. That's a key a data and AI and machine learning and such. Absolutely, uh, and that's a key point. Let's let that resonate for a minute as we go and listen to our sponsor. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Over 3 million data breaches happen every single day. That's over 2,000 records being compromised every minute. So often, we focus on securing web data access. But what if the attackers are already inside, having gained direct access to your storage through data management software? When it comes to communications that go directly into your storage devices, make SNIA your first line of protection. SNIA's conformance testing limits outdated communications that are known to be used by attackers. It works continuously behind the background to make sure your storage is protected. To find out if your data is truly secure, visit our website at www.snia.org forward slash cyber test. All right, and we're back with uh, Josh Davis, our security evangelist. It's quite clear that he's earned that title. Uh, you hear the, the passion and uh, just the urgency uh, in his voice, uh, which really reflects clearly his heart on the issue. Um, I wanted to talk about the other cert um, that uh, is the elephant in the room that you'd mentioned. You let your CISSP lapse. Talk to me about that. Well, uh, okay, so I would say specifically the reason I did was uh, sort of career change. I kind of shifted at Georgia Tech uh, my research thrust. Even though I was an MBA, going out there, shaking hands, not kissing babies because you don't kiss babies in the military, but uh, <laughs> talking to military folks and kind of sharing our capabilities, uh, I, I shifted to data analytics, big data and all those wonderful buzzwords. And I started to study that domain. So not in depth, but I started working on a lot of PhDs in that space. And so at the time, I actually thought my son said, was, you know, someone setting on cybersecurity, even though I know in my core that data and analytics and all those wonderful buzzwords are at the heart of cyber, I never realized I would come back. So mm -hmm. um, what's needed is kind of getting first back into uh, this community that I sort of left. I would say I probably was out of the cyber world, um, geez, maybe six, seven years, like, you know, in there hanging out with the, going to DEF CON and and going to B-Sides and doing all that kind of like, yeah, like the words you said, community. I kind of left that community. Um, and so now I'm jumping back in. What's crazy though is uh, I bought books for CEH and CISSP, and I'm using some software we have, a uh, little gaming tool, to actually help train myself in regards to getting my certs back. So, oh. yeah, I mean, how useful is a cert unless you're in the industry? And that's something else interesting too. I hadn't thought about that. I let it lapse because when I shifted domains, it was no longer valuable. Indeed. And it remains valuable uh, as you're doing it. And, and that's, you know, probably the reason why I see Squared and CompT and the others have their, um, you know, the necessity to keep your skills up, just like any other practitioner in any other discipline. Well, you know, we think of doctors and-, and That's right. And I, yeah. Go ahead. Well, and, and they're, trying, they're trying to do that, right? They're trying to do what doctors and others do and hold you accountable for um, continuing ed. Here, here. But I don't, I, don't, I don't really know how you do that well. Yeah. Right. Um, not not the context of a cert, but yeah. Ho hopefully that answered your question. But yeah, I hadn't really thought much about it. Really, I I lapsed paying for it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just never got around to it. Well, and you, you talk about how you do that well, just in the context of a cert. I don't think you do. Uh, it's in the context again of this mosaic. If our industry is a mosaic of certs, education, and expertise, and you know practical doing the individual is probably also a mosaic of those things. And so you have to keep right. probably, you know, you have to feed all those portions of the beast as it were. Uh, and so a lot of these things lead us to what is clearly and, and definitely a passion of mine and my heart, especially here in Colorado Springs, as uh, you know, we've had our, our low points in, 
in 07, 08, and um, you know, this is my hometown. Um, very proud of my city, proud of my state. I love it here, I love the people here. We are emerging for sure as, as a player in cybersecurity with the National Cybersecurity Center here and just the opportunities now for cybersecurity education. My heart is now for, especially with our veteran population and others, to get out into the industry, get picked up and do the work. There are a number of roadblocks for these folks and we've hit on them. Um, you mentioned the mandates inside of DOD for certs and education. Um, what do you see uh, as some, some solutions to continue to get people into this industry? We talk about all these openings, but yet they're struggling to find people to fill them. So uh, it's a great question and I, I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, an answer because I would say that I, I don't have an answer. Um, but what I do have is some opinions in regards to the culture change that's going to have to happen around our use and practice uh, of these tool sets. Um, and then transition them from a military wartime perspective to a civilian, almost like, um, yeah, making sure you, you keep the chicken coop locked up and, you know, buttoned up so, uh, you know, the, the raccoons and the possums, and oh, by the way, if you didn't know those possums kill chickens too, but anyway, if those don't get in and actually rob your, your business, because that's part of the problem we have now, is it's almost like uh, the culture's changed where someone can come to your front door, you know, maybe break in, they don't have to have the keys, break in, steal some of your data, hold your company hostage, and FBI and others can't really do much to help you. So it, I would say this culture change of rethinking cyber, maybe even away from the warfare to, um, I don't know, just just good practice, Hmm. I hate I hate the phrase cyber hygiene just because it sounds it sounds clinical. Yeah. But yeah, culture culture change and acceptance that this isn't going away, but it isn't necessarily a war. Sure. Well, you you talk about um, the diverse set of, of farm animal threats, <laughs> as it were. It also it, it kind of drives me toward what I think some of the the pioneers of the blockchain. Uh, model are, are, are pushing. You, do, you, do you mind commenting a bit on your thoughts about blockchain and, and, and its future and maybe helping us do some of that? So I don't have a lot of experience with that. I, I dealt with some FBI folks in the past in regards to kind of researching it. I mean, I see there's tools and concepts of how we can connect and communicate differently. Um, I, I'm trying to think about this word pioneer, though, because when you said that, hmm. um, let me take a step back, because uh, I know blockchain is, is, is popular news right now, but like pioneer and cyber, I, I, uh -huh. I think these pioneers are emerging now. They weren't at the beginning. I think cyber at the beginning, I mean, go back to, you know, LulzSec and, 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 and 4chan and all the, all the kids just having fun being bad. <laughs> and then it shifts into the kids having fun being bad to mafias and nation state tied intelligence communities being bad. And now shift it to where my economic system, my ability to make money and feed my family is based upon me having my shingle out on the internet. Yeah. Uh, there's got to be pioneers out there changing how we do that. It's almost like, yeah, I never, I never thought of that analogy. And forgive me, I get a little philosophical here, but like when my wife's grandparents uh, great, great, great grandparents moved to Powder Springs, Georgia. Uh, the dude, Mr. Moon, got like a thousand acres yeah. and paid only a little bit of money for it and started building his family around that. And I feel like the internet and the web in the 90s and the 2000s was really us getting these little land grants to start experimenting. And now these pioneers have got to figure out what the hell are we going to do with this? Um, so. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't get to the point of blockchain, but I, I feel like this concept that you have as a pioneer, I think that's something that we need to talk about more because I think we need a, a revolution in how we approach, communicate, and, and train for cyber. Oh, indeed, and, and you know, I appreciate that and giving me a chance to think more about my own word. I mean, I see this last uh, National Cybersecurity Center Symposium lis listening to Vance Brown, um, what a what a visionary, what a passion, and what a heart, and I think uh, 
he really, I think, gets this concept of, of pioneer and, and sort of what we now as a community need to do is kind of embrace that as we've done that in the past in, in history as a country, as an industry, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, kind of internalize what that what that means and the significance of that and and what is beginning and, and probably need to probably, you know, it's interesting. I'm just kind of thinking off the cuff here, but having some good cybersecurity historians in place that help us document and move yeah. forward, you know, um, okay. and, and so I'm sorry, I get, I get go excited ahead. and blame the caffeine, but the word pioneer and you kind of go on the thread here got me got me to thinking why I'm caring about so I don't know if anyone knows on the on, you know on the podcast here that I, I have an interest in uh, old tractors and it just recently huh. started the reason I'm so fascinated with it is I can sit on a 1951 Ford 8 in tractor put the key in crank it and it runs yeah now I have been pondering what is our software and especially being a military guy we have old software that's old and like you know 30 40 years old is still being used yep. what is it going to play like 20 years from now and so i feel like there's an appreciation for this old that we need to reshape and the word pioneer i, I, I abe i really thank you for that word because i think you've actually inspired me here Good. um because i want to start thinking about this domain differently and i, I like it um so yeah I, i'm totally on the bandwagon if you want to try to find these uh historians of cyber I mean, let's start another podcast or something, because that, that sounds like a fantastic way to learn from our past as we move forward to the future. Well, and, and definitely uh, I've experienced that because uh, NSA did a really good job, you know, with the National Cryptologic Museum. And, and I love going in there because I love breathing in, uh, you know, my heritage and, and our heritage in this industry and seeing the milestones and realizing what the turning points were. And I think the better understanding we have of that certainly and, and, you know, somebody like you can help us do that, I think, uh, the better we move forward. You know, so it's, you know, it, it goes to the merits of why we have history and philosophy built into our university system. Right. You know, it's, it's, again, part of this mosaic that's, of the human okay. being. Okay, so that, that's neat. And that's even validating why we need uh, these universities and these serve as a means of helping to articulate that mosaic you provide, that, that, that you use. Because... I mean, geez, we've been we've been doing history analysis for uh, forever since humans have been on the planet. Um, are we doing that in cyber? Sure enough. Uh, so, speaking of sort of the history, now moving to the future, uh, there are so many companies now that are doing massive cybersecurity hiring. Um, you having been an educator, now you being an evangelist, and, and you know, noticing your other, other titles is strategic partnerships. How do we connect the workforce with the with the uh, with the industry? Okay, so part of the reason I joined your cadence is because of the vision that the CEO has of leveraging, and I can't stand the phrase, but I'll say it anyway, gamification okay. or serious games within the term. But taking an immersive, and that's the key word, an immersive environment to place someone so that the experience is genuine. Um, and I don't know about you if you've written code, but like with code, man, when you are like in the zone, everything else around you ceases to exist and you absorb and you become part of it. So with, with cyber defense and offense, same stuff happens. And being able to train someone that philosophy, like to train that approach, those techniques on paper or just conversations, it's not enough. So sure. immersion. So I would say one thing you're gonna see in the market is more application uh, of immersion to game-like style approaches. Second one, and I didn't necessarily really get when I joined the company, is that cyber ranges and those concepts that obviously the military uh, constructed are going to become, in my opinion, much more um, commonplace. Maybe the term will change from cyber range to something a little more commercially friendly, but it, it'll, it'll have to be because I'm starting to see that your workforce one, interviewing talent and testing them out, especially cyber, before you hire them, it's not like a coder, right? I can give a coder a test. Yeah. Throw a test at them, see if whether or not their resume matches what they said they can do. With cyber, how do I do that? Well, if I have an environment where I can actually have you fight a mission and see if you're defending our infrastructure using our tools the way you said you could, I could test it out. But then furthermore, I imagine that workforce, those ranges, that environment is going to be um, 
secondary to how we actually operate. Um, this mix between virtual and real. So that, that's kind of one, obviously, uh, kind of focused opinion of, of sort of where we're going in the future. But I think it's really about practice and about art form and doing. Well, I certainly can't help but agree with you. You know, the, the companies that I see that are really winning, um, especially in what I'm doing, I'm training raw cybersecurity talent, you know, giving them the basic tools right. and expertise and experience to then go out there and be the raw talent. And the companies that I see that are winning, the ones that then have an introductory period for their employees as they bring them up to speed in more specificity. You know, I create generalists here at SecureSet, um, but then, you know, these companies take over uh, with this immersion and I, I have seen some that are winning with that. You know, and, and I really, it's, it's been such a delight. This is definitely, and hopefully Chris agrees, uh, really a springboard, I think, for some more discussions with you, Josh. I, I like your heart, I like your vision. You're clearly a visionary um, and that's attached to your heart. And I tend to attach my heart to things very much. Um, it's been a delight to talk with you. Um, we've been talking with uh, Joshua Davis here, the Director of Strategic Partnerships and a security evangelist for Circadence. Um, and uh, before, uh, before we go, uh, Josh, again, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for your heart and for the time. Thank you as well, Ed. All right, Josh, take care. And uh, farewell to our audience, and we'll see you next time. The views or opinions expressed during this podcast are not those of Colorado Technical University. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at newcyberfrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.